Hey everyone, I'm Alfred and welcome back to The 36 Lessons of Vivek Last time we read all the way up to Sermon 21 Well, we read Sermon 20 and then explained that and stopped before Sermon 21 which begins now, of course The Scripture of the Wheel first the spokes are the eight components of chaos, as yet solidified by the law of time. Static change, if you will, something the lizard gods refer to as the strike. That is the reptile wheel, coiled potential, ever preamble to the never action. Second, they are the lent bones of the Aedra, the eight gift limbs to Sithisit, the wet earth of the new star, our home. Outside them is the Aorbis and not within. Like most things inexplicable, it is a circle. Circles are confused serpents, striking and striking and never given leave to bite. The Aedra would have you believe different, but they were givers before liars. Lies have turned them into biters, their teeth are their proselytizers. To convert is to place oneself in the mouth of falsehood. Even to propitiate is to be swallowed. Third, the unenlightened are those uneaten. Sorry. The enlightened are to those uneaten by the world. Fourth, the spaces between the gift limbs, number 16, the signal shapes of the demon princedoms. It is the lock and key, Ceres and Manticore. Fifth, look at the majesty sideways, and all you see is the tower, which our ancestors made idols from. Look at its center, and all you see is the begotten whole, second serpent, womb ready for the right reaching, exact and without enchantment. The heart of the second serpent holds the secret triangular gate. Seventh, look at the secret triangular gate sideways and you see the secret tower. Eighth, the secret tower within the shower, tower, is the shape of the only name of God, I. The ending of the word is Omsimi. Here is another piece of wheel symbolism. And Vivek refers to the eight spokes of the wheel as pieces of chaos, as well as the divines. This is why there are eight. The law of time refers to the dragon god Akatosh, who is also the god of time. The lent bones of the Aedra may refer to the earth bones, but it may refer to the places of reality that the Aedra still have a bit of power in. The Aorbis is just the name for the entire known universe, I believe. Let me double check that. Yes, it is the universe. Mundus is just the reality that we that you know mortals exist within our bus includes mundus and other things like the ethereus and all of the daedric planes of oblivion the enlightened are those uneaten by the word the world and the confused serpents line are both References to Sak Satakal, uh, the Yokudan god of everything, who may or may not exist. Of everyone, he probably exists the least. But the Yokuda in the past have shown to know something we don't, so maybe they're onto something. The space is between the gift limbs, number 16. This is the spaces between possibly the spokes of the wheel, but possibly somewhere else, between the limbs of the gods, maybe. The number 16 is the signal shapes of the demon princedoms. This is just a reference to how there are 16 primary Daedric princes. And the spaces between them, that number 16, are the planes of oblivion that each prince inhabits. The towers are a bit more complex. There are places in the real world, in Mundus, that are places of divinity, of creation, and of pure power. 
Some of them are built and made strong, like the Nemidium, the giant brass Dwemer creation that could have become a new god, is the Brass Tower. The Throat of the World is one. Um, there's an Adamantine Tower. But Red Mountain, Dagath Ur, you know, the holding place for the Heart of Lorcan, became the Red Tower. Because, obviously, the Heart of Lorcan is a powerful, world-shaping and reality-changing item at its core. Our ancestors made idols from as a reference to the Aldmer. The Aldmer, spelled with a D, are the progenitors of the Altmer, spelled with a T. And what's more, a lot of other races of Elf. Mer, specifically. Um... Look at its center, and all you see is the forgotten hole. Second serpent. The second serpent is Lorcan. This is confirmed later in the sixth, where he says the heart of the second serpent holds the secret triangular gate. A triangle is one of the symbols of Almsivi, of the tribunal, because it has three sides, and they have been referred to as a gate or a gateway. So the heart of the second serpent, we know second serpent is Lorcan, so the heart of Lorcan holds the secret triangular gate. It holds the secret of the tribunal. The case is, that's how the tribunal became gods, using the heart of Lorcan. Look at the secret triangular gate sideways and you see the secret tower. So in the fifth they say look at majesty sideways and you see the tower. So looking at the beautiful world you live in in a certain way, all you will see are the places where it connects the tower. And looking at the tribunal sideways, you see the secret tower. They don't want anyone to know that the heart of Lorcan is within the mountain. The secret tower within the tower is the shape of the only name of God, I. Another reference to Chim. Or Kim, possibly. I've never actually heard it out loud. Um, but yes, this is a reference to how even though the tribunal do not want people to know it, Vivek, in his 36 lessons, did admit to the source of his divinity being within the tower, being within Red Mountain. This one's a bit confusing and bad to start on, but don't worry. 22 is a bit more logical. Sermon 22. Then Vivek left the first whirling school and went back to the space that was not a space. From the provisional house, he looked into the middle world to find the second monster, which was called the Treasure Wood Sword. Within years of the pomegranate bacon, banquet, it had become a lessening tune to the lesser Velothi houses. They preached of its power. The treasure wood sword, splinter scintilla of the high and glorious. He who wields it becomes self-known. The warrior poet appeared as a visitation in the ancestor alcove of House Mora, whose rose-worn Prince of Garlands was a hero against the northern demons. Vivek congregated with the bones. He said, A scavenger cannot acquire a silk sash and attempt to discover the greater systems of its predecessor. Perfect happiness is embraced only by the weeping. Give me back and do so freely what is barren of my marriage, and I will not erase you from the thought realm of God. Your line has a notable enchantress that my sister I am is fond of, and from her murky wisdom alone do I consent to ask. A bone walker emerged from a wall. It had three precious stones set in the lower jaw, a magical practice of old. One was opal, the color of opal. The bone walker bowed to the prince of the middle air and said, The treasure wood sword will not leave our house. Bargains were made with black hands mafal of the greater shade. Vivek kissed the first precious stone and said, Animal picture, rude walker, go back to the lamp that stays lit in water and store no more messages of useless noise. Down. He kissed the second precious stone and said, Proud residue, soon dispersed, serve no guarantees made my foreimage and demand nothing of its underskin. I am master evermore, down. He kissed the opal and said, Down I take thee. 
And then Vivek drew into the hidden places and found the darkest mothers of the Morag Tong, taking them all to wife and filling them with undusted loyalty that tasted of somersault. They became as black queens, screaming live with a hundred murderous sons, a thousand murderous arms, and a hundred thousand murderous hands. One vast and moving event of thrusting, kill, laughter in alleys, palaces, workshops, cities, and secret halls. Their, holding, their movements among the holdings of the Ra theme were as rippled endings, heaving between times, with all fates leading to swallowed knives, murderous mo moaning, and God's holy rape hyphen erasure of wet death. The King of Assassins prevented to Vivek the treasure wood sword. My lord, the King of Assassins said, the Prince of House Mora is now fond of you as well. I placed him in the corner of Dagon. His eyes I set into a fire prayer for the wicked. His mouth I stuffed with birds. The ending of the words is on Sivi. House Mora is an underappreciated house. They don't have a lot of things going on. Typically, people think of the Great Houses as the trinity of Great Houses. Redoran, Hlalu, Telvani. And occasionally, they remember that House Indoril existed because it is the origin of one Nerevar, possibly the most important character in Morrowind. And, of course, House Dagoth existed as well. There are some other houses. There is one more house... And I don't remember if House Mora is it. But yes, House Mora is there. This may or may not be uh, a story about Vivek founding the Morag Tong. A bone walker is just the term used uh, for an undead. For whatever reason... While they do use the word zombie in Skyrim and some other places in the Elder Scrolls, they invented the like neologism new word Bonewalker for Morrowind specifically. But possibly it just refers to a specific type of zombie created in Morrowind. Who knows? The lower Velothi houses are just the people that aren't the big deal houses. The reason that it says that one of the gems was opal, the color of opal, is very unclear. Yes, one of the gems set in his jaw is an opal. They encrusted a skull with gems. Sure, fine. And one of the gems was an opal. And then they made sure to clarify that the opal in question was opal covered. Very confusing. It would be like saying that a birthday cake is birthday cake flavored. Shouldn't that be a roundabout way of saying it? it is what it is? They do not mention the other types of precious stone. I also don't know why. But yes, um, Sermon 22 also refers to Mephala. Uh, Mephala is considered the anticipation of Vivek, I believe. In that Vivek is kind of the reincarnation of her. But the Morag Tong considers Mephala their founder. So this could be Vivek taking credit for founding the Morag Tong and saying that he did so so that they could find one of his creations, Treasure Woodsword, and then kill him. I don't know why Treasure Woodsword's mouth becomes stuffed with birds and that's how they ensure that stays dead or silent rather confusing and just so we're all clear here when they say northern demons they just mean nords one of the warrior poet uh, one of the people the warrior poets visits here 
Yes, Outlander. What do Whose you rose-worn Prince of Garlands was a hero among, against the Northern Demons. This may or may not be the Bonewalker. The text is uh, obviously very obscure, but it may be someone who is still alive. Or a different dead person who didn't become a Bonewalker. But yes, he fought the Nords in the numerous conflicts that happened between the Dunmer, Timer, Dwemer, Nords, and occasionally the Argonians. Though I believe during the Second Era, the Nor Nords, Argonians, and Dunmer entered into a very solid um, All right, I'm alliance. Sorry. The word slipped my mind. Pardon. Sermon 23. The scripture of the sword. First, the sword, treated as a delicate meal, is the symbolic of college. It serves you well in the first half of life. Name one dynasty that knows this not. Second, the unity of my approach is understood by the immobile warrior. True eyes are acquired. Rejoice as my own subjects and realms. I build for you a city of swords, by which I mean laws that cut the people who live there into better shapes. Third, Girls burn their dresses on my arrival if I am armored. They crawl to me as bled pilgrims. Minor spirits die without trace. Follow me of all of the alm city if you are to mark your days with killing. I, al the third law of weaponry. Fourth. The immobile warrior is never fatigued. He cuts sleep holes in the middle of battle to regain his strength. Fifth. Instinct is not reflex action, but many miracles held in reserve. I am the welfare that decides which warrior will emerge. Beg not for luck. Serve me to win. Sixth, the span of the apparently inactivated is your love of the absolute. The birth of God from the Nechman's wife is the abortion of kindness from love. Seventh, the true sword is able to cut chains of generation, which is to say creation myths of your enemies. Look on me as the exiled guardian. Garden, all else is uncut weed. Eighth, I will give you an ancient road tempered by the second walking way. Your hands must be huge to wield any sword the size of an ancient road. Yet he who is of the right stature may irritate the sun with only a stick. Ending of the words is Omsivi. The sword treated as a delicate meal is the symbolic college. Boy, what a strange way to say using a sword will teach you something. The fact that it serves you in the first half of life is because as you get older, you cannot fight as well. This is something mentioned in the level up menus for Morrowind. Every time you level up until you hit 20, I believe, initially, um, you'll get a unique message. Initially, the messages will be things like, stop overthinking it. Or, you've realized that it's not as hard as you thought. Later on, the messages become things like, you're going to eventually make a mistake, and then you'll die. You have achieved perfection, and all, the only way there is to go from here is down. Try to stave that off for as long as you can. Or even things like... You eventually will fail, because you'll make a mistake at the same time that someone better comes along. You might as well accept that. However, if you get to levels after that, they'll say the efforts of hard work always look like luck to saps, but you know the truth. Something in that matter, at least. I build for you a city of swords, by which I mean laws that cut the people who live there into better shapes, is a reference to the strange and um, really Orwellian laws set about in the city of Vivek. Um, Vivek is just claiming that Go the ahead. laws that get a lot of people put in jail for minor things like, you know, following the wrong religion are actually there to make you better. Because this is the right way to live no matter what anyone else says. 
Instinct is not reflex action, but many miracles held in reserve. That's mini as in miniature, the shorthand for miniature, not many as in multiple, plentiful. Yes, instinct is not an action. It's not something your brain does. It's something that God does. Miniature miracles held in reserve. I'm the welfare that decides which warrior will emerge. Again, battles are not won by your individual skill or luck. They're won by God favoring you. And then beg not for luck, serve me to win. Again, you do not win because of your own talent. You win because Vivek says so. This appears to be another lie to tighten Vivek's stranglehold. Seventh, the true sword is able to cut chains of generations, which is to say the creation myth of your enemies. This may be a reference to how, while fighting warfare, you may commit some iconoclasm and destroy some history along the way. It may be a literal case um, where, by becoming talented enough at using a sword, you can literally shape history. And it may also be magical and quantum, as with a lot of things in this book, about you may actually change the past with your divine power. Um, one could argue that since this is the scripture of the sword, it could be about the swords well, that Nerevar or Vivek were known one. to use. Speak but it could also freely. be about one of Kaganrak's tools, the things that are used to change and gain power from the heart of Orkham. One of them is a dagger. Could be worth a note. The birth of God from the Nechman's wife is obviously a reference to Sermon 8, and the second walking way is a reference to Sermon 6. Your hands must be huge to wield any sword the size of an ancient road, and yet he who is of right stature may irritate the sun with only a stick. You need to be badass to wield a badass weapon, but if you're badass, you don't even need it. You can fight the sun with a stick. So... Why walk when you can ride? Rules and learnings about the swords. Why walk when you can ride? Sermon 24. Then Vivek left the house of assassins and went back to the space that was not space. From the provisional house, he looked into the middle world to find the third monster called Horde Mountain. It was made of modular warriors running three, free, oh, but spaced according to pattern. Space and from the highest warrior who could cut clouds that they spread out beneath him like a tree, a skirt whose bottom circle was an army that ran through the ash. Vivek admired the cone shape of his child and remembered with joy the whirlwind of fighting styles that instructed him during the days before life. Vivek moved into Veloth, saying Onus, but before he could even get within sword span of the monster, a trio of lower houses had trapped Horde Mountain into a net of doubtful doctrine. When they saw their lord, the Velothi cheered. We are happy to serve you and win, they said. Vivek smiled at those brave souls around him and summoned celebration demons to cleave unto the victors. There was a great display of love and duty around the netted monster, and Vivek was at the center with a headdress made of mating bones. He laughed and told mystical jokes and made the heads of the three houses marry and become a new order. You shall now forever be my buoyant armagers, he said. Then Vivek pierced Horde Mountain with Muatra and made it all a big bag of bones. At the touch of his right hand, the net became right scripture, and he threw it all northeasterly. The contents spread out like sugar glows, and Vivek and the buoyant armagers ran under it laughing. Finally, as the bones of Horde Mountain landed and became the foundation stones for the City of Swords, which Vivek named after his own sigil, the net fell across it all and in between, or as bridges became bones. And since its segments had been touched by his holy wisdom, they became the most, the most perfect of all city streets in the known worlds. Throngs of Elothi came to the new city, and I am and Set gave it their blessing. The streets were filled with laughter and love and the strength of the tree-shaped enemy fall. children. I am said to my sister Hyphen and brother's city, I give the holy protection of House Indivin whose powers and thrones know no equal under heaven, wherefore came the Hornetor. Set said, To my sister Hyphen Brother's city, I give safe passage to the dark corner still left of Molag Ball, and I give it this spell as well. So-ti-ha-sim. 
which is my name to the mighty. It will protect the loss unless their flight is on purpose, and I will fill the roads and alleys with the mystery paths of civilization, and give the city of my a mind and make it a conduit to the full concentrate of the Alm City. Thus was founded the city of Vivek in the days of Resdain. The ending of the words is Alm City. Sermon 24 is about the founding of Vivek the city by Vivek the god. Vivek first leaves the House of Assassins. He leaves the Morag Tong. Earlier mentioned in Sermon 23. Nope, 22. Um, Vivek goes to fight um, another one of the children. However, he's beaten to it by a bunch of people who all serve at Vivek. He's delighted by it, and so names them the Buoyant Armagers. They are knight errants and champions of the temple, of the tribunal temple. Um, they usually only answer strictly to Lord Vivek. Um, they fight against the Blight and other Dagoth Ore things. They usually wear glass armor. Some of them wear traditional chitin because they're Dunmer. That's what they wear. And some of them even have things as high as Daedric gear. They fight a lot of necromancers as well. I've actually fought one in my own LP. Or fought alongside one, fighting a necromancer. Um, so he died on the way, but whatever. They're very classically and romantically knights. Um, but yes. Onus means... I forget what Onus means exactly. It means, like, destiny, duty, that sort of thing. Horde Mountain is not one creature as well. It is an army of beings that all fly about in the shape of a, tr in the shape of a tornado in a cone. Um, and yes, Horde Mountain is netted by the soon-to-be point Armagers, and the numerous bones found within all of the bodies of Horde Mountain then becomes the foundation of Vivek. Vivek's city carries Vivek's own name because he's very egotistical, but in this, he argues it's because Vivek is the greatest name anyone could ever have ever had. Um, the net and the bones become parts of the city and they're what make the city so disjointed about? and like it is uh, the streets are filled with laughter And since it's and in this line, since its segments had been touched by his holy wisdom, they became the most perfect city, the most perfect of all city streets in the known worlds. Um, this is Vivek being egotistical and talking about how amazing Vivek City is. You know, the city named after him. Much of the thirty-six lessons of Vivek are exaggeration or confusing for its own sake, and very strange. Much of it is an admittance of truth, sometimes an admittance of guilt even, or an admittance of secrets that people are not meant to know, like the true nature of the tribunal, or um, things like that. And in another trinity, the third thing that the lessons of Vivek are is out, egotistical and masturbatory in favor of Vivek's own power. Um, which is really how you break it down. Vivek wrote all of these. He claims to have written them. And I don't know anyone else who could have. Perhaps the people in his propaganda office. But yes, according to these, you know, if you believe these, of course you would think Vivek is the amazing super over god. Having read these, it's the only conclusion you can really come to. 
we know this to not be completely the case. But yes. I am instead allegedly give the Vexity their blessing as well. This is a reference, uh, the fact that I am Amalexia gives Vivek City her blessing by saying that it has the protection of House Indoril is two things. One, it is a rare reference to how Amalexia is actually a member of House Indoril. This is something not talked about yet, but Amalexia and one Indoril Nerevar were married. She was his wife. This is also why the Ordinators wear the so-called Indorail armor, and why the Indorail armor looks like Lord Nerevar. It is styled after him. That's why it has the mohawk and the face scar, because Nerevar had a face scar, and a mohawk, and a worn ear. Um, but yeah, that's why it's called the Indorail set. That's why the Indorail people are even guarding Vivek City. Um, in Vivek City, where Vivek does the stomping, the bright gold ordinators are obviously everywhere. Uh, and then there is a different type of ordinator that looks similar but wears different colors that is found in Mournhold, Amalexia's personal city. Um, and the reason that they are Void Armagers is that Void Armagers are fun, happy, and jet around Morrowind solving problems and doing little side quests. Whereas Ordinators are sour, grim, and usually just there to beat the hell out of somebody who says that Vivek isn't the best. That's their job. They really like doing it. Um, another thing, though. The Ordinators who live in Vivek City are equipped with Indoril armor, which may or may not be made out of ebony, at least partially and is the best medium armor set found in Morrowind. Like, found in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. And then they are also equipped with ebony maces. For those not familiar with the in-game progression, Daedric gear, Daedric weapons, are the best type of weapons, typically. And ebony weapons are the second best type of weapons. So they're equipped with almost the best gear. One thing, though, Daedric yeah, gear know. is actually the same as Ebony gear. It's just that it's been cursed with Daedra. Um, for example, in Skyrim, when you can craft these, yes, you okay. can see that uh, the crafting recipes for anything Ebony and anything Daedric are identical. The only difference yeah, is that one of them requires a Daedra heart. Daedra gear requires a Daedra heart. Ebony gear does not. Go However, ahead, another thing that you can do is you can take an existing piece of Ebony gear and curse it. Fuse the soul of the Daedra to it through magic instead of, you know, as it's created in the forge. And turn Ebony into Daedra that way. Um, both of these, however, are implied to curse the weapon. Three and even if it doesn't literally weapon. curse the weapon, is it is implied pleasure. that uh, it is a painful thing to do to a Daedra to make a Daedric weapon. Um, as a result, you know, by the fact that their name is Daedra, Daedric weapons often have a stigma associated with them. They're seen as unholy. They are very strong, but... Even if they do require uh, the painful death of a Daedra to equip, some Daedra still use them. What's more, um, because of their association with the Daedra, some people consider them unholy, and so you wouldn't want gods, holy warriors, using them. My point is, is that the Ordinators are equipped with very, very high tier weapons excellent armor. Um, but what's more, very expensive armor. In what I think is this video, you can probably see me sell it. And I sell one piece of ordinary armor and immediately bankrupt any salesperson just with one piece.
In fact, I usually need to haggle them like up and send them down for self. Yes, sir. Or they have to haggle me down. Um, but my point is, ordinators have very, very good gear. Whereas, typically, if a blind armature has good gear, it's because they found it. The ones who have Daedra gear are very, very rare. Um, and even the people who have glass gear are nice. rare. Most of them have typical kite and stuff. But yes. That's why Almalexia has her own set of ordinators. That's why they wear Isn't stuff it? called Indoral Armor. And that's a little piece of lore on Daedra. I suppose there's no... Set gives the city a spell. The spell is so Sil or Sothasil. And he says that it's his name to the mighty. Presumably this is when his... He is actually properly renamed. Because as of now, he's still set instead of Sotha Sil. I am is also still Amalexia. Vivek is not Vek, though. He is Vivek. You know, his divine name. Presumably because he is full of himself. And so has elected to give himself his full proper title. Sermon 25. The scripture of the city. All cities are born of solid light, such as my city, his city. But then the light subsides, revealing the bright and terrible angel of Veloth. He is in his pre chimerical form, demonic vet, pale and gaunt and beautiful, skin stretched painfully thin on bird bones, feathered serpents encircling his arms. His wings are spread out beneath him, behind him. There are red and yellow ends like razors in the sun. The wispy mass of his fire hair floats as if underwater, milky in the nimbus of light that crowns his head. His presence is undeniable, the awe too much to bear. This is God's city, different from the others. Different from foreign countries put their denizens to s cities from foreign countries put their denizens to sleep and walk to the star wounded east to, may to pay homage to me. The capital of the northern men, crusty with eons ice, bows before Vivek the city. Me, it, together. Self-thought street rush through tunnels. I have rebuilt myself. Hyper-eyed signposts along my traffic arm, soon to be an inner sea. My body is crawling with all gathered to see me rising up like a monolithic instrument of pleasure. My spine is the main road to the city that I am. Countless transactions are taking place in my veins and catwalks and the roaming, roaming, roaming as they roam over and through and add to me. There are temples erected along the hollow of my skull and I will wear them as a crown. Walk across the lips of God. They add new doors to me and I become effortlessly trans immortal with the comings and goings in the stride heat of the market where I am traded for. The yell of the children hear them play, scoffed at amused desire, paid for a native coin, new minted with my face on one side and my city hyphen body. I stare with each new window. Soon I am a million-eyed insect dreaming. Red spark war trumpets sound like cattle in the ribcage of shuffling transit. Their heretics are destroyed on the plaza knees. I flood over into the hills, houses rising like a rash, and I never scratch. Cities are the antidotes to hunting. I raise lanterns to light my hollows, lend wax to the thousands of candlesticks that bear my name again and again. The name innumerable, shutting in. Mantra and priest, God's city, filling every corner with a naming name. Wheeled, circling. Running river language, giggling with footfalls mating. Selling, stealing, searching, and worry not me. This is the flowering scheme of the Arbus. This is the promise of the Sijic. Actually, they've spelled that wrong, I think. Oh, they have. Interesting. This is the promise of the Sigis. Egg, image, man, god, city, state. I serve and am served. I am made of wire and string and mortar, 
and I accede my own precedent, world without end. The ending of the words is almsy. Um, this describes at first how all cities are born of light. Possibly how all cities could be as amazing as Vivek. But in this city, it is Vivek. Um, the bright and terrible angel of the Veloth is, of course, Vivek's name for himself. His pre-chimerical form is pure Vec. And it refers to him as demonic, perhaps because of his strange birth. He has wings. This is he has wings in this depiction, something normally not associated with him. But he also has his fire hair. The wispy mass of his fire hair floats as if underwater. Um This is God's city different from the others, claiming that Vivek is different from any other city in the world. It kind of is. Um The rest of this is all named with... It's all, um, metaphor. Vivek is... claiming that... he is the city. He is physically and bodily become the city. So, the place where heretics are... executed is his knees. His, the streets and the rivers are his veins and blood. Um, he makes reference to the inner sea being one of his arms. He makes reference to people running across his body. He makes reference to himself, his divine body, you know, Vivek himself in the city of Vivek, possibly as the penis of Vivek City. Okay, how do I write this? So, assume Vivek City is a giant god. And Vivek the god is the penis of the giant god. The reason that I suspect this is because my body is crawling with all gathered to see me rising up like a monolithic instrument of pleasure. What could a monolithic instrument of pleasure even be? Um... There are temples erected along the hollow of my skull, and I will wear them as a crown. Walk across the lips of God. So yes, every part of Vivek the city is like a part of Vivek's own body, and vice versa. And so in this way, he makes the city out to be as great as he is, and makes both of them greater by association. And what's more, claims that anyone who lives in Vivek is a part of Vivek the city, and so must be a part of Vivek the god. Which should be what anyone involved with the tribunal hopes for and hunts for. To be associated with Vivek in any way. Makes it worth it. You know? Um... Houses rising like a rash may be reference to how it is difficult to get a house started. You know, an itchy. But as long as you don't scratch it, it'll heal normal and your skin will be tougher as a result. So, houses rising like a rash and I never scratch. Cities are the antidotes to hunting, as you can funny thing. Prior to things like agriculture, humans in the real world had, um hunter-gather societies before they became very agrarian. Presumably the same thing happened in the Elder Scrolls. And so the agrarian societies then feed Vivek the city, allowing the city to exist as itself. He then goes on to claim that everything done in the city, and possibly in all of Moral since he mentions egg, image, man, god, city, state. So all of Morrowind, maybe even all of, maybe just all of Ardenfell, but possibly all of Morrowind. He claims that everything is done for his glory. So lighting lanterns and candlesticks. Just, you know, to see. Um, he then claims that building Vivek City, the fact that this city exists at all, 
has been the plan since the dawn of time. He says that it's the flowering skin of the Arabes and the promise of the Sigi. Um. Any time. So this word is spelled P S J J J. Um, it's supposed to be spelled with four J's, but in this it's spelled with three J's. Um, it is a typo, and it was in the original text. It was in. It was written that way in Morrowind. Now, on the one hand, maybe Michael Kirkbride made a typo. It would make sense. As far as I remember, there are only four authors credited on all of these. Um, so, for the several thousand books, I'm sure that we've seen the Brian David Gilbert video on all of the Elder Scrolls books. Um, and I cannot remember the exact number of authors. There were either four or eight. Either is a very, very small number of authors for so many. And it would make sense that, considering the unfinished, buggy, broken state that a lot of Bethesda games come out in, there would be a lot of typos. On the other hand, maybe Michael Kirkbride did make a mistake. But maybe Vivek made a typo in his own book. Vivek didn't really deal with Siji a lot. Um, I think it would be kind of funny, but fitting as well. And they also think that it would be amusing to see this infallible man-god who claims that he's this indestructible super beast. He made a typo in the Bible he wrote for himself. Anyway. Um, the two gods who created the universe uh, were Anu and Pado. Padome's original name may be Siji, which is nearly impossible to pronounce, but that is the intent. It's P-S-J-J-J-J. -J -J -J. Um, again, spelled with only three J's in the 36 lessons of a book. Siji, Sij, Siji, Pasiji, is thought by some as the way of the original way of spelling Padome. He has been mentioned a few times spelled Padhome. P-A-D-H-O-M-E. However, Siji, P-S-J-J-J-J, eventually was turned into Sithis, and that is the name that most people refer to this being as Sithis. And yes, that Sithis is in the Dark Brotherhood. Um, Padome is the other strong force opposing Anu in the creation of all of the universe in our abyss. Is there something I can do for you? And the fact that Vivek would shout him out while doing something as simple as building a city is very indicative of him. Sermon 26. Then Vivek left his architectural rapture and went back to the space that was not a space. From the provisional house, he looked into the middle world to find the fourth monster called the Pocket Cabal. The monster hid itself in the spell list of the great Khmeri wizards of the extreme east, where the Emperor Parasol was grown up. Vivek disguised himself as a simple traveler, but radiated a tenuous sense fabric so the wizards would seek him out. Of Muatra, he made a simple walking dwarf. Before long, the Invisible One was among the libraries of the east, feeding the essential words of the pocket cabal to his walking dwarf, and then running when the magic would fail. 
after a year or two Go of its ahead, thievery. Outlander. What do you need? Muwacha was sick yeah, to its stomach, and the walking dwarf exploded near the slave pens of the wizard's tower. The pocket cabal really then slipped itself into the mouths of the slaves and hit again. Vivek watched as the slaves erupted into battle and break babble and breaking magic. They rattled their cages and sung out half hymns that formed into forbidden and arcane knowledge. Litany fiends appeared and drank from the excess. Grabbers from the adjacent place came into the world sideways, the slave talking having disrupted the normal non-cardinal points. So, of course, a giant bug appeared, with the greatest eastern wizard inside of it. He could see past Vivek's disguise and knew of the warrior poet's divinity, but thought himself so powerful that he talked harshly. See what you have wrought, silly triune? Columns of nonsense and litany fiends. I cannot believe how reason or temperance can be made whole again due to your eating, eating, eating. Consort with more demons, why don't you? Consort. Vivek stabbed the wizard through his soul. The giant bug harness fell in the slave cages, and the slaves ran about free and reckless. Too reckless more with pregnant words. Colors bent into the earth. Vivek created a dome-headed demon to contain it all. The pocket cabal is therefore interred here forever. Let this be a cursed land where sorcery is broken and maligned. Then he picked up Muwatra by the beard and left the ghostly hemisphere of the domehead demon. On its boundaries, Vivek placed a warning and song of entrance that contained errors in it. With mock bones of half-dead Muwatra, he created tent poles of a forest fortress theory, and fatal languages were imprisoned for all time. Set appeared and looked on what his brother's sister had created. The clockwork king said, Of the eight monsters, this is the most confusing. May I treasure it? Vivek gave Set to do so, but told him never to release the pocket cabal into the middle world. He said, I have hidden secrets in my travels, and made a likeness of Muwatra to ward against the unwise. Under this dome, the temporal myth is no longer man. The ending of the world, the words, is Om Sivi. Um, Vivek fights the fourth monster after leaving Vivek City in this sermon. The fourth monster is called Pocket Cabal, and it appears to be sapient words. Considering the power of words in the Elder Scrolls, this is a very, very dangerous beast. It may also be words in the sense of the Thum, the Shout in Skyrim, in that they are words that you can affect reality with, speak to reality, and it listens and responds. In Skyrim, this is very simple. You say fire in Dovazul, and the universe gives you fire. However, there has been a lot of words becoming fact and words becoming real. The net that contained um, the Tornado of Beasts, what was his name? Uh, Horde Mountain. The net that contained Horde Mountain was originally a um, just some words. So, Pocket Cabal being able to speak this much is dangerous. The Khmeri Wizards of the Extreme East is House Telvanni. Um, Emperor Parasol is a type of mushroom, if I remember correctly. Yes. It's the giant mushroom you see instead of trees sometimes. And um, the Telvani turned them into the towers, as we've seen here and there. He turned his spear Muwatra into a sapient walking dwarf for some reason. I am unsure as to why. Um, Vivek stayed near Pocket Cabal and had... Muatra swallow the words that he created to ensure that reality would stay as it's supposed to be. Um, and then Pocket Cabal hid, hides in the mouth of slaves. He becomes their words because he is words and hides there. Um, reality is getting a little weird. And so, uh, Vivek creates a demon with an open head so that everything in this whole region can be trapped inside this demon's head. 
So the sill has interest in it, still being called set here. Um, so so the sill takes the demon away. Inside the dome of the demon's head, normal reality is basically out to lunch. This is mentioned with the phrase, under this dome, the temporal myth is no longer man. Um, and so the sill considers this the most confusing of all of the monsters. Interesting. Sermon 27. The scripture of the word first. All language is based on meat. Do not let the sophist fool you. Second, the third walking path explores hysteria without fear. The efforts of madmen are a society of itself, but only if they're written. The wise may substitute one law for another, even into incoherence, and still say he's working within a method. This is true of speech and extends to all scripture. Third, do not go to the realm of apology for absolution. Beyond articulation, there is no fault. The adjacent place where the grabbers live is the illusion of the vocal or middle realms of thought, by which I mean the constructed. This is how I stole the certainty of the Chancellor of Exactitude, perfect to look upon from every angle. When you come out with a vocal, you can never be certain. Fourth, the truest body of work is made up of silence, as in the silence that results from no reference. By the word, I mean the dead. Fifth, the first meaning is always hidden. Sixth, the realm of apology is perfection and impossible to attack. Thus, the wise avoid it. Trinity and unity is the word and world of action, the third walking path. Seventh, the sage who suppresses his best aphorism. Cut off his hands, for he is a thief. Eighth, the clothes of the broken map are worn by fools and heretics. The map is an exit for laziness. It is the dusty tongue, which is to say the given chart that most take as a story that is complete. No word is true until it is eaten. The ending of the word is alms city. Um, a sophist is somebody who uses a specific type of thought and thinking, and it comes from... Socrates, I believe, which is weird because I don't think there is uh, Socrates. Uh, yes, a sophist is a type of teacher. Oh, it doesn't come from somebody's name. It comes from the word Sophia, which means wisdom, and is the same root word for sophisticated. Interesting. Interesting. Again, there's no Greek in this u universe, but whatever. The third walking path is the way of saying somebody is a hero, a protagonist. Um, the people on this list, like the hero, if you click the link for Third Walking Path, it links you to Hero, and it gives you every single person who has been a protagonist in an Elder Scrolls game. So, people who are on the Third Walking Path explore hysteria without fear. So they dip their toe into people freaking out who are not afraid. Um... The efforts of madmen are a society of itself, but only if they're written. So, people who are crazy and say a lot of dumb, crazy stuff can be civilized, but only if they write it down. Because then you can really start to get something out of it. The wise may substitute one law for another, even into incoherence, and still say he's working within a method. Um, smart people will make adjustments or allowances Um, I don't know what all languages based on meat means. Truly, that confuses me possibly more than anything. Vivek's reference to how he stole certainty is a reference to Sermon 4. The truest body of work is made up of silence, as in the silence that results from no reference. By the word, I mean the dead. 
you cannot argue with silence. So silence is kind of pure in that sense. The first meeting is always hidden. This may be about um, the 36 lessons themselves. The first meeting is always hidden. What is initially obvious... What is initially meant is never obvious, rather. And you really have to dig into Morrowind lore, the game itself, and any other book in The Elder Scrolls written by one Michael Kirkbride to figure out what in God's name Vivek means here. The realm of apology is perfection and impossible to attack, thus the wise avoid it. Somebody apologizing to you is difficult to attack in any sense. Uh, it is difficult to argue with them and to win an argument if they are apologizing. Trinity and Unity is the world and word of action. Using all three parts of the Trinity, Warrior, Mage, and Thief, is the word and world of action, the third walking path, being a hero. Um, but yes, this is the scripture of the word. Another one of the long lists that Vivek made. Earlier he mentioned the scripture of the sword. Now we are on the scripture of the word. Uh, let me see if there's anything else yet. He did wheel before that as well. That was 21. Um. So yeah. Whew, that's another one down. Would it be another short hiatus after this, but thank you for watching. This has been Sermons 21 through 27 of the 36 Lessons of Avec, and I have been Alfred. Thank you for coming by, and have a nice day. I'll see you. Bye.